Washington Square Park as Bug House Square has a very long history. Washington Square Park is one of the two oldest public parks in the city of Chicago. It was established in 1842 as a gift from the American Land Company to the city itself. And basically the only provision that came along with the deed to the land was that it should always serve as a kind of public park. The history of Washington Square Park is very much impacted by the neighborhood that surrounds it. When it was first established as a public park, the belief was that a very kind of wealthy and affluent neighborhood would grow up around it. And that's why it was given such a respectable name. It's Washington Square, right? It sounds like a park that you would find in a Henry James novel. One of the first big changes that the park experiences occurs in October of 1871, when the Great Chicago Fire sweeps through the area, destroying almost everything in its path. Two things that it doesn't destroy, though, are the Malin D. Ogden Mansion, which miraculously survives despite being a wood-framed structure, and the park itself, uh, which becomes temporarily a place where people set up tents and where those who are displaced by the fire recover and, and reside. In the early 1900s, when we're in the midst of the progressive movement, People are really kind of championing the sort of values of free speech. So you might have a lot of male members of the industrial workers of the world talking about various economic issues. But Bughouse Square is also where you would see Lucy Parsons give a speech, a true champion of the labor movement in this country. By the early 20th century, a lot of the wealthier residents are beginning to kind of move farther north and then farther east, kind of closer to the lake and into what is the, the Gold Coast neighborhood. And these large old Victorian homes, a lot of them end up being carved up into boarding houses. And Washington Square Park, aka Bughouse Square, was located very close to what is the most infamous of all of the Bohemian hangouts that first appeared on the scene in the 19 teens and lasted through the early 1930s. And that's a place known as the Dill Pickle Club. So if you were in the park and you were to walk just a, a little bit south down Dearborn Street, towards Delaware, you would see an alley off to the side. That alley, back in the day, had a name. It was called Tucker Place. If you turn down that alley on any evening, anywhere between 1917 and well, roughly 1933, you might see a green light guiding you towards an orange door. And written upon that orange door were three phrases, step high, stoop low, leave your dignity outside. And you knew that you'd arrived at the Dill Pickle Club. And the way in which it relates to Bughouse Square is that in its earliest years, really what the club was, it was basically providing a sort of indoor version of a Bughouse Square. Historians aren't certain when Washington Square Park transformed into Bughouse Square. It's a pejorative term, it's being used to describe a place where people suffering from mental health issues are being interred. It's not a polite term, and it's really getting at the idea that it's eccentrics and cranks who are speaking in the park. But the speakers embrace it, and because they embrace it, and they weave it into their poetry, they weave it into their plays, they work it into their newspaper articles, that becomes the name by which the park is known. About 20 years ago, I found myself lost somewhere in northern Italy, the town of Brescia, the home of Pope John XXIII. I wandered into a trattoria, a restaurant, and there the old woman said, Americano? Si, sí, signore. What city? Chicago, signore. Chicago, she said. Boom, 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 boom. No, signora. Chicago is more than that. Far, far more. The Studs Turco may not have been born in Chicago, but the city was certainly its home. And for a good portion of his youth, he lived very close to Bughouse Square. His family ran a boarding house not too far south at the intersection of Wells and Grand. And a lot of the people who resided in that boarding house were transient workers. And transient workers 
made up a good portion of the audience of Bughouse Square. So it's not surprising that studs would follow them to the square and become enamored of, of the place. Studs was the guy who took my dad out for a drink the night that I was born. So basically my relationship with Studs was from beyond infancy where I came out screaming from my mother, there was Studs. Going, come on, Herman, let's go, let's go get a drink and celebrate this guy's birth. Well, Studs was primarily was a radio host. He was an actor, a radio host for almost half a century. I think there's nobody in the world who should be accorded the prize for inventing oral history more than Studs Terkel. He had a driving curiosity and a driving fondness for mankind. And I think much of that was born here. As a child, he saw this, a cross-section of Chicago humanity. He wandered over here during the heyday of what were the Bughouse Square debates. He heard Carl Sandburg speak here. But there were also, as you know, a number of lunatics who got up on soapboxes and talked about free sex and God is dead. And, and this really impressed the studs. This was the Vox Populi. This is where people shared opinions, whether nutty or important. But it was, in its time, as you know, probably the most active free speech area in this country. And I know I'm a Chicago booster, but I still will maintain that's true. The visitor may crave a sample of Chicago's nightlife. One recognized center for the version of this kind is Rush Street on the near north side, just north of the Chicago River. Here are numerous well-known restaurants and nightclubs, while the principal theaters and several famous hotels are situated within the loop. Whether it's a nightclub, a theater, or a motion picture that suits you best, you're sure to find the entertainment you're looking for in Chicago. The neighborhood once again begins to transform. It undergoes a, a decline in, in the post-war decades, and you see the park itself become a place where the perception is, is that it's perhaps not particularly safe, where there's illicit activities occurring. Um, it's still used in the daytime by a, a wide range of city residents, but at nighttime it's, it's not a space that people would frequent as much. Well, certainly in the 60s, this place became uh, pretty weird and pretty dangerous. And I was still a kid in most of the 60s, but when I would come by here, uh, it was a sort of, how shall I put it, a disreputable three acres in the middle of the city. Now, Bughouse Square is kind of a notorious spot. The whole area uh, down near uh, Oak and Clark Street was kind of a seedy area, and it was a, considered a closet at the time. If you were a gay male, it was some place that you would you know, cover your face before you were seen there, and you could be harassed. The police would come and be able to shake you down uh, in order to you know, just to walk down the street. So it was our closet at the time. I could tell you to live lives that are honest and that are free. But the more we try to live lives that are honest and free, the more we get fucked over. But we're not going to accept anymore. And if the shit hits us because we're not going to accept it anymore, that's okay. Because we've taken the shit all, all of our lives anyway. And we can deal with it in an overt form as well as the kind of covered form we've had to take. It took place on uh, June 27th, uh, which was the true anniversary of the Stonewall Riot the year before in 1969. Planning of the Pride March, I'd say, involved about 20 people. It was a very loose organization of the Gay Liberation Front. Once it was organized, they said, oh, we can you know, start it at Bughouse Square because we don't need a permit. Well, uh, let's march over. And that's one reason it was the first in the world is because instead of doing Sunday like New York and LA did, we thought, well, there'd be nobody downtown on a Sunday in Chicago and we want to expose it to people. So we picked Saturday instead and uh, marched on Michigan Avenue. And we ended up dancing around uh, the Picasso. Once we lose our history, we lose ourselves. We might as well not exist. My relationship with this special place 
goes back to a time before my memory. I mean, I, this has always been a part of my life in one way or another, whether walking through here with my mother and I was in a stroller, or later on coming here with my parents to see the activities of not so much the bug house square debates, which were a little before my time, but the resurrected bug house debates, which came around in the mid eighties. Once again, the area transforms and oddly it's almost come full circle. And in terms of being an, an, a fairly affluent upscale neighborhood and area again, Well, I moved into the neighborhood back in 83, and at that point, it was very desolate. The park overall was not cared for. There was minimal uh, landscaping efforts. There was no community interaction. It was a very intimidating environment. And I don't know politically or economically from the city of Chicago what the support demands were, but CPD, Chicago Park District, was really on their own. And um, there was new development occurring within the neighborhood, so it was the progress and the hope of the neighbors that really took it up to a higher level than it is now. With approximately 600 parks in the Chicago Park District, a park advisory council is essential for a park. We advocate for the park. I think it helps to elevate our concerns and get them recognized. When I retired in 2014, I was looking for volunteer opportunities. There was two I had already signed up for, and one of the members of this council was at my board meeting telling about this new group that had just formed for the park, and I overlooked the park, so the park was always a very important part of my life. I think it's quintessential in that we have an academic structure over there at Newberry, we have a massive residential structure behind us with historic landmark property, mega high rises of great value. So it's, you know, it's a little bit of everything that makes up Chicago. Now some people, when they look at Washington Square Park, Augusta Square today, they might decry the fact that it's become by and large a dog park. But in many ways, it's really kind of keeping with its history. One thing that you discover as you look back at the history of the park is that it's always changing and evolving to fit the needs of those who are using it. And so at a time in the late 19th century, early 1900s, when people were really kind of crying out for a space that could be a free speech area, the park became that. The LGBTQ community could come together and organize and launch the very first gay pride parade. The park could be that. And now, at the end of the 20th century and the early 21st century, when people have lots of pets and they need a place to take them while they live within the city, the park can become that. And what's great too is the park doesn't have to shed any of these previous identities either. Instead, it just kind of expands and adapts. Judd's died on uh, Halloween in 2008, and the following May on his birthday is when a very small group of us, Studs' his son, and just a handful of others in the most informal burial you could even imagine. Uh, we buried him under a little tree over here, dug a hole, and just poured the ashes in. That, that tree is now gone and it is part of the dog run here, which I think Studs and Ida would find incredibly amusing. Studs and I never had a dog, as far as I know. Now they've got hundreds of them, hundreds of them, but I'd be happy to show you. Oh. Hi, Hi. how are you?